This video will discuss spin orbitals in our continuing journey towards hartree fock theory. All right, so a spin orbital, or to start off an orbital, when we say orbital, we generally mean a one electron wave function. So this is going to be a wave function which applies to a single electron, uh, describing where it is in space, uh, x, y, and z or the probabilities of where it is likely to exist, as is indicated by the term wave function. We would say an orbital is occupied if an electron exists within that orbital, and we would say an orbital is virtual if it is unoccupied or there is no electron within the orbital. Uh, an, an orbital would be a spatial orbital if we are specifying the x, y, and z Cartesian coordinates of the orbital, uh, not indicating anything about the spin, whether that's spin up or spin down. And a spin orbital would specify both the x, y, z Cartesian coordinates and the spin of whatever electron is within the orbital. Right, so we would indicate uh, Cartesian positions by the vector r, which indicates the x, y, and z coordinates in three-dimensional Cartesian space. And we would indicate the spin by the spin variable omega. So that's, this is generally not going to be an um, alphabetic w. This is generally going to be the Greek letter lowercase omega. So omega can take on two possible values. Omega can e either equal alpha, spin up, or beta, spin down where this type of notation here is the Dirac notation for those uh, spin functions. Uh, you can review Dirac notation in the quantum chemistry playlist if you are confused about that. Okay, so overall putting these two together, what we have for a spin orbital, its coordinates are generally indicated by what we see the vector uh, x. Um, I know that's confusing with the Cartesian uh, axis x, but uh, you kind of have to figure out from the context whether we're talking about a single uh, Cartesian variable or whether we're talking about the three Cartesian variables plus the spin. I think it's usually pretty clear based on context, but uh, just ask questions in the comments if that's ever uh, unclear. All right, so the x vector would be the r vector uh, with the omega appended to it. So x vector would be x, y, z, omega. And the spin functions are going to be orthonormal to one another, as we saw in uh, back in the quantum chemistry playlist. So the integral over the spin variable of alpha star alpha is going to be 1, as is the integral over the spin variable of beta star beta. Complex conjugate in each of those cases, um, each being defined equal to 1, meaning it's normalized. And then when you do alpha star times beta or beta star times alpha, you end up getting zero, showing that those two are orthogonal to one another. Put those two facts together, this means that beta, alpha and beta are orthonormal. All right, so I mentioned that overall we have a spin orbital, and usually spin orbitals in this chapter are going to be indicated by the Greek letter chi. So that's sort of like an X, but it's got this little kind of extra dip on, on this cross stroke and then, uh, and then loop up there. So I try to also make it pretty clear when I'm, into, when I'm writing a chi versus an X, but again, uh, please let me know if the notation is ever unclear. Um, this is sort of a consequence of hartree fock There's going to be a lot of notation. I'm just going to try to uh, make it as clear as I can whenever we uh, look into some new things. So chi is a spin orbital. It is a function of x1 if we're talking about electron 1, electron 1's x, y, z, and spin coordinates. And that is a product of electron 1's spatial orbital, which we're indicating here as phi, the spatial orbital, x, y, and z coordinates of electron 1, times sigma, the spin function, which is a function of the spin variable omega. Right, so this means that for a given spin orbital, we can either have it be that spatial orbital times alpha or that spatial orbital times beta spin up or spin down. And then uh, going back to what we also talked about early in the quantum chemistry playlist, uh, phi star, the spatial orbital times phi, complex conjugate of the wave function times itself, uh, gives you a probability density for where you're likely to find that particle, or in this case, this electron in three-dimensional space. So multiplying that probability density times some volume element, 
dx dy dz, indicated here as uh, d cubed r. That would give us the probability of finding electron 1 near location R1. Uh, again, I'm going to be going through these uh, fairly quickly because it is somewhat of a review of the quantum chemistry playlist, but uh, do feel free to review those chapters or ask questions as you like. So if we take this probability of finding it near a specific point and we integrate that over all points, uh, negative infinity to infinity in x, y, and z, We'd indicate that volume element there, d cubed r1 being dx dy dz, triple integral over x, y, and z. We could also integrate, we could also indicate that as the Dirac bracket phi phi, which would be equal to 1, meaning that this spatial orbital we have is a normalized orbital. All right, so if the set of all of the spatial orbitals we have are said to be complete, then what we have is that any function of three-dimensional space, any function of x, y, and z, could be defined in the following way as a sum from i equals 1 to however many of these there are. Typically, that would be an infinite number if it was complete, of some coefficient times that particular function. So this is to say that a linear combination of a complete basis set can form any function of that same uh, number of variables. So this would be true for any function you could imagine in three-dimensional space if you have a complete set of spatial orbitals. And in order to get what those coefficients are, you would just need to do the overlap integral of uh, phi star with f. So we would take whatever function we have, multiply that by the complex conjugate of our spatial function, integrate over all three dimensions, and that ends up giving us uh, what this coefficient needs to be in this linear combination. Okay, so that is the basics of spin orbitals as we'll be using for the rest of this chapter on Hartree-Fock theory.